um, high technology companies. There's relatively little awareness, understanding of intellectual property um, beyond the traditional areas. So if obviously corporations like Siemens and Philips, um, pharma companies have huge intellectual property departments that do everything they can to extract value from IP. But the question of like, what is the most important form of intellectual property for my company and how does my company extract value from intellectual property is relatively, remains relatively not asked in sectors such as like um, the food industry, the furniture industry, um, the fashion sector, um, the banking sector, the insurance sector, particularly in, in the European Union. So if we move away from this whole thing like that, from this cliche that patents, IP equals patents equals um, strategi strategies from high technology firms, I think the first question about like is really to go to senior management and, and wake people up that um, IP is not just patents but complies trademarks, copyrights, design rights, and a whole range of soft forms of IP, such as know-how, protection against unfair competition, and trade secrets. So these various different forms of intellectual property really come into play um, when, when talking about the value and how to commercialize about it. The first question is to, to break up that cliche and think that patents are, only, are the only way of um, extracting value from IP. So moving to the next um, chart, um, I think a central question is to stop thinking in terms of intellectual property just from a legal lens, but to look at IP from a managerial perspective. Um, an IP strategy um, must be centered around questions such as like, um, are the relevant target groups aware about IP? Um, that implies providing information resources for employees, um, developing guidelines for valuing and managing IP, and providing also targeted training courses for upper management. It is very surprising that many CEOs would exactly know the difference between a cash flow and a return on investment, but they would absolutely not know the difference of um, a freedom to operate um, and um, or criteria for patentability. So, and this is even more surprising that even in very IP savvy industries, there's a kind of like a lack of understanding of IP. And if it is understood, it's very much seen through a legal perspective, um, litigation perspective. The enabling opportunities of intellectual property are not are not leveraged to the extent that that would be um, successful or good. Um, for, for the corporation. So I, I would like to come back now to this question, what is intellectual property? It seems pretty trivial and most people tend to think, well, obviously we know what IP is, but I would like to go back here to the basic definition, intellectual property. What the IP system does is that it provides property rights over output of the human mind. And this is a very, very powerful tool. We are in a position to have private property over our creativity, over our intellectual output, over our ideas how to design things. It is, in my view, the latest stage of capitalism. It's an intangible assets-based capitalism. And this is very powerful and at the same time also very challenging um, because at what, what stage do we want to take the the system of capitalism further? Uh, where are the limitations? What will be the next thing after intellectual property rights? Will we have emotional property rights? Um, what other things will we start to propertize? On the other side, if we look at this thing that we have property rights and we want to understand how these property rights can be leveraged for maximum firm value, this type of thinking is not yet fully established in many companies and it's part of our mission as a, as, a co as, a, as a consulting firm to help companies move that step from just IP protection and IP litigation to IP strategy. I, I would really like to emphasize on this because this is a very, very important difference in how we understand intellectual property as compared to the classical intellectual property rights um, understanding. 
So when looking at the concerted approach for IP, I think it's important to look at strategy as an interactive um, game really, where you ask not only in terms of like um, awareness, but also in terms of understanding what can and cannot be protected, what is the value of protection, and how can I go along of the, in that, and what type of, and how can this whole be in question be developed and identified for implementation. Um, so moving on to the next slide, if this worked. Um, so there are many corporations, as I previously said, that are not typically associated with IP, which is a pity because they do have a lot of value relating to IP. There is a need for greater understanding of communicating from the IP department to senior management that these are assets of a company. These are actually the core assets, how we are thinking, how we are perceiving things, how what our what our framework of understanding is, this is the major asset. Um, we have long passed from an economy that was based on mere agriculture, that was based on farming, for example, here in the United Kingdom, to a merely service-driven economy. Now, what is a service-driven economy? That is essentially an economy driven by intangible assets, by views, by ideas, by, by new tactics of doing things. Now, all of these wonderful assets of IP, of ideas, can be turned into private property through the IP system. The question is, once you have that, what can you do to extract value and to manage IP from an assets perspective? The first thing to understand here is raise awareness on the IP among key decision makers. Promote greater knowledge um, about the opportunities of transfer. Um, increase commercialization opportunities and permit exclusion of competitors. So that is also a very important aspect of the IP system to exclude others from using it and obviously secure freedom to operate in international markets. I think within this context it's important to remember that intellectual property is a means to an end um, and not a thing in and by itself. IP protection in the first instance is expensive and costly and not anything that brings in money. Um, what brings in money is a right strategy to extract value from its IP. Under the right strategy, it's a tool to generate and capture value. Um, so how do you go along in doing that? So we, we, I mean, this is beyond the scope of the, this talk, but I think to set the framework here thinking, to set the the context of how to approach that, it's important to sort of like simple strategic management steps to identify the market dynamics and the global economic trends in which the IP strategy is embedded in, um, to assess the quality of the patents, to define product market, markets, and to evaluate the role of patents in securing new revenue streams. I think this is particularly important. Um, as an, as, an, as an element of trying to understand where are you heading with your IP strategy, what is the purpose of filings, in which areas are you going to invest your money to protect IP. There's a very, very strong linkage between firm strategy, technology strategy, innovation strategy, and the intellectual property strategy. Unfortunately, in many companies, what was supposed to be a unity of business strategy technology strategy slash innovation strategy and IP strategy has become separated where innovation and IP are going in different ways and where the business strategy is yet heading in a different way which means that there's a loss of opportunities and loss of wealth. Um, another point about IP management has a lot to do with like cleaning up your portfolio and understanding which patents you want to keep and which patents you want to get rid of. Same for trademarks and design rights. Now, for the purpose of this example, I would just like to talk here about patents. Uh, as you know, there's a technology life cycle. So, um, technologies have an emerging phase, a growth phase, maturity phase, and decline phase um, in, in its performance. Now, the big mistake that many people keep making is to determine the IP strategy and the value of the intellectual property independently of the technology cycle in which 
in which the underlying technology lies. So this can have fatal implications. So what does it mean in practice? Um, let's take the, the patterns of research in motion, um, the patterns on the BlackBerry. Um, the patterns on the BlackBerry are pretty solid patterns. RIM has spent an awful lot of time litigating them and so on. Um, and they are fine. The catch is just that the type of technology that the RIM patents are protecting are in strong decline phase and they are in a decline phase well because of the entry of new ma of new competitors in this market so with the iPhone with the Android um, nobody with the arrival of smartphones there has been a rapid rapid decline in the in the underlying technology that the RIM patents were protecting so when talking about IP management and the subsequent value of the intellectual property, thinking a little bit where you're standing here in the technology life cycle can be a matter of survival, not only for your IP department, but also for your company. Um, so what determines the value of an IP portfolio? Um, Obviously, the quality of the patents, which comes down to the type of job the patent office is doing, the returns you can have, the target market dynamics, and the management strategy. So it's a combination of the quality um, of the underlying technology and how sharp your company is in managing its patents. Um, so one thing I'd like to say here is there are various strategies of managing the IP ranging from an open innovation strategy to a very strong closed research and development strategy. Um, and there's a range of spectrum between these two extremes. There's a range of spectrum between like managing IP from an open innovation point of view and managing the IP from an R&D point, from a closed strategy point of view. Unfortunately, especially in the United States, IP is still very, very strongly managed under a closed R&D strategy. It is still very, very strongly managed under a paradigm of um, you keep out of my territory and if you enter my territory, I will make your life as miserable as possible. Um, it is there's relatively little thinking so far that open innovation is strongly related to intellectual property. This is very regrettable because open innovation is has, in my view, at its core an IP strategy, but it is not seen as such. And that starts with this very interesting observation that the people who are doing work on IP are usually lawyers. The people who are doing work on open innovation are usually management scholars. So this is very interesting. How come the different groups of people are working on innovation, depending if we're talking in, about an IP-based innovation and an open, in, open innovation strategy? Strange enough, if both are very similar related to each other. I think the reason for this is that there's still really this, what I said earlier on, this lack of awareness and understanding of what the, what the role of IP is in, in corporate performance. And, and part of the mission of Oxfirst is to, to help change that and to sort of like um, help companies maximize the value from their IP assets to the best extent possible. Um, so I would now like to move a little bit here um, between the various forms of, um, of, um, of IP, IP management, talking a little bit here about open innovation. So open innovation is a term that's heavily used, um, heavily abused, and heavily <laughs> heavily leveraged for whatever people want to have it be. Um, and it's a term that's has, that is positively connotated. Now, I want to like clean that term a little bit. So the first person who coined that term was essentially Henry Chesbrough at UC Berkeley. Um, and what does it mean? Um, I think it, 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 at, the, at the gist of it, where is this slide? Open innovation is about breaking up borders and recognizing that you can um, that you can leverage a lot, a lot, a lot of 
research from outside. So if you have this part here in the middle as the corporation, a closed strategy assumes that the company needs to have all of its knowledge internally. It needs to be basically knowledge about everything and cannot per permit itself to um, leverage outside resources. Open innovation says, um, well, look, there are a lot of people outside and inside the company, and let's try to maximize creativity no matter where it comes from. Let's open up our borders and let's permit um, a growth based on, on inputs independently of where the borders of the firm actually start. What I find very interesting is that what open innovation is arguing has a strong relationship what we know from um, international trade theory, where um, trade economists have been showing I think for a couple of hundred years that countries that open up their borders and start trading internationally um, achieve growth not only for themselves but also for their trading partners and overall promote um, economic prosperity at the international level. So what I found was very interesting that we had this piece of knowledge in trade theory but nobody really ever bothered to move this type of knowledge that we had from trade to management and to discuss what that actually had to say from a manager, what that actually meant for the company, for the strategy a company should leverage at the at the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the firm level rather than at the national level. But obviously, if a lot of companies do the same thing, it, has, it aggregates and summarizes to what is to happen at the national level. I mean, that is kind of like clear. Um, but there is a very strong sense of understanding that we know that opening up borders um, promotes growth. Um, and opening up borders at the four firm level, this is the main message that the management scholars have made, promotes equally growth at the company level. Now, as you can imagine, opening up borders in terms of who's generating knowledge in which context is a question of intellectual property. It is a question of intellectual property because you need to figure out who is going to own what type of knowledge and at what price is this knowledge going to be made available to other partners. Um, now, a couple of European companies have had some very, very nasty experiences where they didn't think about managing or clarifying IP ownership when entering um, into trades with United States companies and happily sharing all the knowledge with the U.S. partner, the U.S. partner having some very good IP attorneys protecting that knowledge through U.S. patent law and selling it back to the Europeans at a horribly high price. I have evidence from this from a Dutch company and from a Spanish company who got burned with this. Um, so it seems kind of like trivial, but <clears throat> if you're opening up your borders, you need to be clear on which conditions you're opening up and who is going to own what in that game. And especially if all of this open innovation activity is going to generate new research, um, who will have the rights over this research to, to sell it, to license it out to other people, to commercialize it ultimately? Um, these are really, really important questions. seems incredibly trivial, but I have met a range of corporations, again, outside the traditional high technology field, which, had, which were absolutely blissfully innocent about these questions and just had no idea that that you could actually even do that. Sounds incredibly basic, but is the reality in many European companies outside the traditional high-tech sector. Um, so obviously, what Open Innovation says is when knowledge is everywhere, you need to find some ad adequate processes to capture that knowledge. And Open Innovation is proposing here three concepts, um, an outside-in approach, an inside-out approach, and obviously co-creation. So outside in, you hire people to come in. Inside out, you also go to other corporations and share what you know. Um, and co-creation, you collaborate with others. <clears throat> the effective IP management in this context requires, sorry about that, requires that the employees in your corporation have some sort of knowledge and awareness about intellectual property and its role in corporate strategy. Why? Because a company as an institution is made out of people, is out of people with a specific culture, with values, with ideas, with creativity, with ways of thinking. This is what constitutes a company. If your people do not know about IP, how can you establish a corporate culture that is IP aware? 
that knows that where trade secrets are, what to share, what not to share. If you're not establishing this type of awareness at the corporate level, what is going to happen is that your intellectual property is walking out the door every day people are leaving work in the evening. Worse enough, if they're changing to a competitor, they're taking your intellectual property and one-on-one -on -one pass it on to your major competitor, which can mean the death of your own company if it's a knowledge-based company. So be very careful about this IP awareness raising, which I mentioned in the first instance. <coughs> So it's not only that not all people are equal, even though we'd like to have that under a human rights perspective, it's also that not all patents are equal. Um, not all patents are equal. There's a selective IP management strategy that is especially important in the context of open innovation. Um, the first step is to figure out how to structure and clean up your patent portfolio. Um, what are the core patents? in your portfolio. What are patents that are important? And what are patents, quite honestly, that you wouldn't need and that are just costing you a fortune to maintain every year? I know very few corporations that have done their homework and cleaned up their patent portfolio. It is like many companies are sitting on their patent portfolio with this myth of thinking, well, we keep the patents because who knows, we can protect ourselves. <coughs> We can protect our market from competition. It's a myth. Um, take Mars bars and Milky Way bars, or I don't know, similar chocolate bars. There are tons of patents on these chocolate bars. Both many the major food industry corporations sit on these patents, thinking they can actually keep their competitor from doing a similar chocolate bar, which is a myth because the chocolate bar from company A is suspiciously similar to the chocolate bar from company B. So the patents have not really succeeded in keeping competition out of the market. But somehow there's still this mythology where we think, well, we have them to keep competition out of the market. We have them to mitigate against risk. And God knows, if it's the IP department, we get away with sort of like making sure there wasn't any litigation, we're already fine. Um, what else do we want? We are lawyers in the end. It's not enough. It is not enough just to keep an IP portfolio thinking, well, we avoided litigation. Um, it's just not enough. In an area where we have a severe economic downturn, where every little penny has to be counted and to make sure we extract maximum value from all of the company's assets, just keeping a huge or middle-sized patent portfolio for the sake of keeping competition out and assuring some sort of mi risk mitigation is just not enough. I don't know of any other part of management of a company where just saying, well, you know what, we got away with it, we didn't have litigation, it's going to be enough. It is about business development, it's about business growth, it is about um, new products, it's about new entry strategies in the market, it's about new businesses, it's about joint ventures, alliances, it is about um, creating strategic portfolios. There's a whole universe behind it that goes beyond just this question of sort of like mitigating risk, IP protection and freedom to operate. Um, so I think with this type of message, um, I, I would like to open this, this, this short intro to, to, to our thinking about IP management and IP asset management to, to the audience. Um, and I, I will open up here, like, if you have any questions, maybe could you, um, I, I think you can all see my screen, could you put them in the chat room? I would also open up the audio view if I figured it out. And let me know if you have any questions, reactions, proposals, ideas um, on the stuff that, that we have been discussing in this webinar. If you have any questions, could you put them in the in this questions or chat room part. Can you see it? It's here on your screen. Oh, there's a question. Wow. Wow, there are many questions. Okay, so there are a couple of like sounds here. I can hear you. Two questions. I'm reading out here the question. <clears throat> can you comment on valuing intellectual property as well valuing IP in a portfolio? Can you guide me 
to some resources on the role of IP in corporate strategy. Another comment here is know-how is harder to protect. I assume what are your recommendations? Great point. Okay, so we have three questions here. One is about know-how and how to protect know-how. The other question is about like the we are referring questions to a short comment on IP valuation and valuing IP in the context of um, corporate strategy. So um, I, I would like to talk here a little bit about IP valuation. Um, let me get back here in my slide. Um, <clears throat> I, I was asked the first time in 2006 what I thought about IP valuation, and um, that was at a conference from the OECD where I was sitting on a panel next to a Japanese delegate, and I started to ask him, well, how much do you love your mother? I didn't want to ask him how much you love his wife, because I thought that's probably too indiscreet, um, but I said, well, how much do you love your mother? Do you love your mother for 10 euros, for 100 euros, for 10,000 euros, a million euros? And then after the initial shock of being asked in front of 500 people how much he loved someone, um, he stumbled that um, he loved his mother very much. Now, he didn't say he loved her for 10 euro or 100 euro or whatever. He said he loved her very much. And I think this is a very important message. When it comes to intangibles, it is a challenge to just put one single price tag on these. Um, when we are talking about IP valuation, Obviously, the quantitative research methods are very important, but what is equally important is to use, give it, give it some time and write also a descriptive aspect of the value of the IP has to a company. The prime question that needs to be asked is, well, as a company, to put this in very, very simple language, as a company, how do you make money and how does the intellectual property you own help you make money? That is the first primary question to, to figure out. And that is not really, that can't be answered by just looking at patent citations, forward citations, and backward citations. That's a question, that's a strategy question. That's a question you need to ask yourself as a company and sit down and say like, what are we doing? How does our IP help you achieve that? Boom. And this in and by itself is already a really, really important process. Um, so, that's the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing, if you're valuing the IP, I have already put this in my message here very strongly in terms of it's strongly related to the IP strategy. I mean, obviously, you have valuing for cost, market value, and discounted cash flows, and so on. These are established research methods, but what you need to think is, like, what type of data are you putting into your model? Um, and there are a couple of things that are important. The one thing is obviously has got to do with patent quality. Um, claims chart analysis is incredibly important. Um, patent landscapes, if you can come up with that. The other question has got to do with, um, well, how much is this stuff being quoted by other people? Backward and forward citations. Very interesting question. Has anyone ever valued, like, has anyone quoted that? Um, the other aspect has to do with management strategy, as I said before. Um, if I am a pharmaceutical company and I own a patent that is not related to my business, I don't know, if I own the patents on the mass bar and I am actually a pharma company, even if this mass bar patent is, has a, a ton of forward and backward citations, it's not going to help me determine the contextual value of my patent. So there's a contextual value here. It's got to be related to my additional competencies I have in the company. Otherwise, I'm, I, I can't really leverage that. That is a big difference to the valuation of tangible assets, where a chair has a value independently of who's sitting on them. Um, there's a contextual value with IP. Um, so, and then what I also said, what is many times forgotten in the IP evaluation, where the heck are you in the technology life cycle? Very, very important. Are you here sitting on a dead-end technology that is sooner or later going to be replaced? Very, very 
challenging in telecommunications and and and, and yeah, where, where, where smartphones, the, 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 the lifetime of, of, of smartphone technology is incredibly short and fast moving. So, um, so I think this is sort of like in a nutshell um, the IP evaluation stuff, which is strongly related to IP management. Um, now, IP portfolio evaluations, I think one needs to sort of like, um, there's a strong, I mean, usually you would, it depends really on the context of the company. Like, if you're looking at one single pattern, that's usually, that must be like really the killer pattern of your company. Usually, you would rather look at portfolios um, in any case. Um, now, um, th there's a whole range of established literature on this. Um, uh, I still think that a lot of, people are just writing these books just to get their name out without like I'm not totally happy here it's sort of like they're presenting like did you know there's a cost approach to valuing patents did you know there's the market approach which is kind of like somehow so simple in the message that I sometimes think they're just writing it to get their name out without spending a lot of time on substance so I'm, I'm reluctant here to, to give here a, a whole range of, of recommendations but um, I, I think the, the book that I really would like to see in this area still needs to be written. Um, now, the other question that's, that people ask, um, had to do with how do you, um, how do you value, how do you value um, know-how, oh, no, how do you protect know-how? What are your recommendations? Well, it's awful. I mean, how do you document that you have know-how? It's awful. At least with a patent, you have it very nicely um, sketched out. But I think one way, even if you're not going out for, for official IP protection with the know-how, is to spend some time and still put things in writing. Um, even if you're not protecting it, if, even if you're keeping things as trade secret, it is really important to keep some written track records to illustrate what your know-how is. That is my thinking about it. But I also think that the patent system was established to overcome that dilemma of know-how where we have essentially some tacit knowledge out there where people have some sort of contextual ideas without really knowing what the issues are. And that was one of the major challenges that the patent office was, patent system was trying to overcome. Um, but I would put as much in writing as possible, and I would make sure in all that to, to have proper non-disclosure agreements in place with people who are working with you, um, and to clarify where in writing who owns what. Um, I think this is very important too. So let's pass on. This is such a small. How can you? How can you make that bigger? Um, there's another question here. Hello from Donald. Um, not all patents are equal. I agree. However, the value of a patent can vary over time. Yes. Do you agree and do you have any comments to make on this? Absolutely. Of course it values over time. Um, I, I, I still think that in, in the whole IP valuation debate, we're still so much at this phase where we're thinking, oh really, it can be valued. Like, that the people haven't started to be very sophisticated yet. It's really still this like, wow, really, you can value it? Rather than thinking, okay, there are loads of methods to valuing it, and the method you're using um, depends on, depends essentially on what you want to achieve with that valuation. Um, obviously, the value of the patent is not, is dynamic. It is dynamic because the technology changes. It's dynamic because the management changes, because um, um, there are new entrants in the market. I can't think of any any asset where, that, where the value is static for the next 30 years. I mean, even if you own a house in Oxford, the value of this house is going to change over time, depending if your house is going to be old and crumpy and needs a lot of renovation, if the, I don't know, if the electricity is breaking down or whatever, depending on the overarching market structure, see what happened with the, with the credit crunch recently, well, not so long ago, um, depending on, the, the, there are a lot of factors so that it changes over time, it's a dynamic fact. So this is really, really important. I think totally agreed with that and I think what we have been trying to say here with sort of like um, technology cycles, that's that's the closest I could think of. Um, 
in terms of like um, illustrating sort of like the the dynamic the dynamic situation in 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 patent value. Any other question? Oh, there's another. Wow, people, this is a lot of questions here. IP management, I'm reading out the next question. IP management and strategy makes pretty much sense in developed countries for most of the reasons that you explained. But in a developing country perspective, do you assess, do you assess IP management and strategy in the same way that you just explained? Very, very good point. Um, I can't see who asked that question, but very 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 good point i think this i think we should do the next the next seminar about this i think this is a very 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 good this is really like a, a, an issue um the the the, 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 the nitty gritty awful part you have in many developing countries has got to do with enforcement um how can you enforce your rights and um I don't mean to discredit Italy today um but like we look today at the Italian data and we saw that there has hardly any IP protection in Italy, um, like for example in the area of design rights. Even so, in Italy there's a very prospering fashion and fashion industry because people don't trust their legal system, so they don't even go up for it. Now, really, Italy is not is a is a is a G8 country. I know that, but it's just something we came up today. Um, the issue about IP in developing countries is really really hard to answer. Um, I do think that in the long run corporations in developing countries do need to think along the same lines as corporations in developed countries do. I do have, and I also do think that in developing country contexts we have been looking at IP in developing countries mainly from a trade perspective. We said, well look guys, be nice, enforce IP, um, try to give us some, some guarantee of protection and in exchange you will get foreign direct investment. I don't know, I find this a horribly biased view because it sort of assumes that the people in developing countries have nothing that's worth protecting and they all need to wait for what is going to happen, what is going to come in from outside in order to 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 to, to leverage um the IP assets and I do not think this is true. I do think there's a major opportunity in developing countries to start protecting their own intellectual property. Um, now, the institutional shortcomings in which developing country firms are embedded in are very challenging, which means that in many developing countries entrepreneurs need to be twice as motivated, determined and entrepreneurial as in the developed world. Why? Because you're facing horrible inefficiencies from the government. Um, you're fighting with red tape more than in developed countries. You have less guarantee of ownership of capital. Um, a lot of challenges um, which are really outside the intellectual property system and has have a lot to do with the overarching business climate, um, with the institutional framework provided by the government, um, and really are beyond just the usual thing where you can't just you sit in a country where you know there's not going to be a civil war, um, there's not going to be a major disease, um, where you know the courts are fair, more or less fair, just makes a major difference. So I think in a developing country context, an IP management strategy needs to do what I said, but in addition needs to factor in the institutional framework and the, the, the economic governance reality it is embedded in. Um, what I have seen is that in many developing countries, entrepreneurs start to invent around the local um, institutions by the government. So, like in Brazil or in Jordan, um, where I did some field studies, I saw that they would never use the local patent office. They would just go straight forward and protect in the United States or in Europe or in Japan um, because they thought that the local patent office couldn't really be trusted. Now this is really hard because of the price difference in, in, in the services provided in these patent offices. Um, so, um, so this is the other thing. So there's a real call um, for good governance. Um, sounds like a cliche, but good governance really comes into play here. Uh, 
I'm not totally sure how the individual company can escape that trap. Um, I also think in developing country contexts, um, there is a need to sort of like start to think in terms of not only patents, but also trademark, design rights, copyright, uh, protection against unfair competition, because it is rather unlikely that if you're sitting in in the Middle East, um, well, maybe, I don't know, let's, uh, no, I mean, no, because they're losing so much money, but, I mean, competing with high technology clusters such as Silicon Valley, if you're sitting in a developing country, is not obvious. But leveraging traditional knowledge, leveraging um, softer forms of intellectual property like trademarks, um, copyrights, um, your music sector, what have you, is a good deal more likely um, than um, than just the usual high technology um, high technology um, question. So I hope that answers in a, in a nutshell this question. But I think this question really deserves a deserves a, a whole seminar in and by itself. Oh, another question here. Given the loosening of government control over the U.S. Patent Office, what negatives and positives do you see? Wow, we are moving here from the developing world to the U.S. PTO. I'm, I'm reluctant to comment on the America Invents Act because I haven't studied it enough. Um, that, that, that I find this a bit hard to say, like what's going to happen. Like, I think what's very good about the American Invents Act is that it seeks to improve patent quality. Um, it seeks to promote um, licensing, um, this type of stuff. I mean, the whole issue about like loosening control, etc. This is a, an old question, sort of like, do markets need control or not? I mean, this is like a question that goes beyond the IP question in terms. Of, this is a big philosophical and political questions. Um, should the market be led to do what it wants? Should the market have some intervention from the government? I mean, this is essentially what also distinguishes them to political left wing from political right wing. Uh, I hope that kind of like gives some thoughts on, on how I think about that. Boom. Are there risks? Another question. How many questions are we having here? Wow. People, uh, there's a lot of questions here. Thanks for your interest. Okay, are there risks of, for companies structuring a patent portfolio of mistaking core, important, and other types of patents? Ways to mitigate this? Yes, there are strong risks about this. There are very strong risks. And I think I don't see enough companies that think along these lines at the moment. They're only thinking about, like, um, along, like, um, what is sort of like the what is just the average, like we have to put forward to mitigate risk. I think there's strong, strong risks of not even doing it and of sort of like segmenting the patent portfolio adequately. Um, and I think um, one way to do this is to hire us and to work with us. <laughs> and also sort of like really to, to think in greater detail about um, IP valuation. So there's another Is this the last question we are having? Hey, yes, this is the last question. So, um, wow, I really didn't expect so many questions and such a lively discussion in spite of the fact that we cannot speak to each other um, face to face. Uh, I think this was a, a great experience here. Thank you for all of these great ideas. Uh, I think there would be a real reason to do a next seminar on IP evaluation and to do a next seminar on IP management in developing country contexts. Um, and, yeah, I think if you have no further comments, I, I would like to close that session now and really thank you for, for your participation and thanks for being with us and I hope we can work together at some point in the future um, in one way or another. Um, if you have any further questions, shoot me an email. Um, I'm happy to, to stay in touch. Thank you once more for your attending our Ox First webinar. Bye.